Hey everyone, do you remember? Until Dawn is an interactive horror game exclusive to the PlayStation 4, released in late August of 2015. Development started at Supermassive Games in 2010, and Larry Fessenden and Graham Resnick were brought in to write the game, both having experience writing horror movies. Now let me be clear. This game is best enjoyed if you go into it knowing as little as possible. So if you haven't played the game but want to, pause the video, go play the game, and then come back because there will be spoilers going forward. Alright? Alright. The game was originally unveiled at Gamescom 2012 as a PlayStation 3 title that would have utilized the PlayStation Move system. This early iteration would have bounced between first and third person where the player would move their character by pointing with the move remote. A gameplay trailer was shown at Brazil Game Show in 2012 that showed the move controller letting you do immersive actions like point a flashlight, shoot a shotgun, and undress Jessica. The less said about that, the better to be honest. A beta demo was also available for the PS3 that, as far as I can see, contained basically an entire playable version of the game at that point, featuring 16 chapters culminating in Sam jumping out of a car with a creature on top of it, sending it off a cliff, leaving Mike and herself as the two survivors. It's interesting to look at this early content because it shows that, with the exception of the ending, the broad strokes of the final game were in place. We have all eight major characters who are dressed fairly similar to how they are in the PS4 version, and Chris and Mike's voice actors are the same in both the beta and the final, though all the other voice actors are different and the characters were remodeled to resemble the new actors. We see Hannah and Beth's death, Mike and Jess in the cabin, we see an early version of the killer, Emily in the mines, Sam in the bath, so on and so forth. This early iteration of the game was received well, but many lamented the PlayStation Move controls, and given that the PlayStation Move underperformed, at least in Sony's eyes, and that the PS3 was at the end of its console lifespan, the game was reworked for the upcoming PlayStation 4. The game was then re-announced at Gamescom 2014, showing off the game as we know it and a new cast of voice actors. The cast now featured Hayden Panettiere as Sam, Rami Malek as Josh, Brett Dalton as Mike, Megan Martin as Jess, Galadriel Steinman as Ashley, Noah Fleiss as Chris, Nicole Sakura as Emily, Jordan Fisher as Matt, Ella Lentini as Hannah and Beth, and Peter Stormare rounding out the main cast as Dr. AJ Hill. I feel that it's important to point out that even when this game came out, these were some notable actors, and much of the cast has only continued to find more success. Finally, in August of 2015, the game was released to the public. The game starts with Mike, Jess, Emily, Ashley, Matt, and Sam playing this genius prank on their friend Hannah, taking advantage of her feelings towards Mike to humiliate her in her own family's luxurious mountain mansion. Is Mike in a relationship at the time? Apparently. Does that warn all but one of her friends pulling this on her? I don't think so. Right off the bat, we're introduced to the idea of a stranger lurking on the mountain with the group. We're also introduced to Beth, Josh, and Chris, the latter two of whom are passed out drunk in the kitchen. I need to emphasize this. Chris and Josh are not at all a part of the prank. The game throws a lot of wheeze around and I need to stress that Chris is exempt from that. Hannah, obviously humiliated and upset by the prank, runs out of the building into the dark, snowy night, and her sister runs after her. This serves not only as the game's inciting incident, but also as its tutorial, introducing you to quick time events, choices, and simple control mechanics. Occasionally, you're shown the perspective of someone, or something, watching Beth try to find Hannah. Eventually, Beth finds Hannah, and the two end up on a cliff. They slip, and a mysterious man offers to help them, but unfortunately, the two girls fall to their deaths. Following this, the player has their first session with Dr. AJ Hill, a psychiatrist who talks directly to the player, warning that while your decisions can't change the past, they can change the future. The main game then takes place a year later when the friends return to the mountain on Josh's invitation, hoping to reconnect and put the past behind them. Gameplay A complaint I see about this game is that It's barely a game. It's a movie with QTEs. But I would argue that's kind of the whole point. The game is inspired by classic horror movies written by filmmakers with performances from mostly screen actors. Yes, this is a walking simulator, but I think that writing off a whole genre of games would be to deprive yourself of some fantastic stories like Life is Strange, Firewatch, and obviously Until Dawn. The game has a simple control scheme, moving with the left joystick, moving the camera with the right, using the X button and the right trigger to interact with highlighted items and characters. Occasionally, you make decisions by leaning the right stick, either left or right, and perform QTEs with the face buttons. 
The game also makes use of the PS4's touchpad and movement detection, leading to some anxious scenes where you have to stay still. The game is divided into 10 chapters where you bounce between the group of friends as playable characters, each time showing the amount of time left until dawn. Each chapter is bookended by a visit with Dr. Hill, who becomes increasingly intense and screwness of the player's actions with his office reflecting current events and locations in the story. Plot Given the admittedly simple gameplay, the plot is Until Dawn's real selling point. The game is a loving homage to slashers and creature features from the 80s, with a little bit of saw thrown in there for spice. The game has a traditional setup of an isolated and extreme environment, a masked stranger, or maybe two, a tense group of woefully unprepared teens, and a prior tragedy that instills the group with anxiety, tension, and supernatural susceptibility. Of the eight characters, four are in relationships, two are exes, and maybe cheating on their partners. Two people like each other, and two have a completely platonic supportive relationship. Nice! The game plays into traditional horror motifs of the group splitting up, those doing the horizontal hokey pokey getting attacked first, and terrible dialogue. Holy cannoli, thank god that's over. Yeah, for real. The core of the game is making decisions, and how those decisions affect the game going forward. Boom. Butterfly effect. Your decisions affect how the people around you treat you, and can change things from dialogue, to scenery, to whether or not people will choose to save your life. The game has a menu that will show you where your relationship stands with other characters compared to when the game started. Another menu shows your decisions and how they affect your options later on. For instance, if you as Sam inspect this bat, Josh will place it to the side, causing it to be within reach if you attempt to hide from the killer later on. A complaint I see is that since you always end up in the mansion and it always explodes, your choices don't really matter. And while I can understand that point of view, I would disagree. I feel like the reward of the ending is seeing the characters you've tried to protect for 10 chapters survive. In my first ever playthrough, I kept everyone alive except for Jessica. And not only did I feel proud that I had made almost all the right decisions and kept almost everyone alive, but I also immediately wanted to start a new game and save everyone. Additionally, at the end of the game, there are police interviews with the surviving characters that show off the relationships you form throughout the game. Characters will be angry about being left behind, remorseful for leaving their friends behind, and pretty scared by what they saw up on that mountain. Their testimonies made me want to find the best ending and correct my past mistakes. But how can you avoid making mistakes? Well, you can't. And that's kind of the fun of it. The unknown. There's no right way to play the game. In some instances, helping others will get you killed, and in others, self-preservation will be your downfall. You might think that's cheap, and maybe that's fair, but I think the game would be boring if you knew you could succeed by always making the same type of decision. I also want to give the game props for the way that collectibles influence the dialogue and story. Throughout the game, you will find two types of collectibles, totems and clues. There are five different types of totems, death, danger, loss, guidance, and fortune. Finding one will give the player a premonition of a potential future, but there are no guarantees that your decisions will put you in these positions in the first place. The second type of collectibles are clues, of which there are three kinds, 1952, The Mystery Man, and The Sisters. In this game, you can track down all these clues that reveal a fascinating subplot of miners trapped in a cave and, due to poor management, forced to eat each other to survive, men who turn into creatures that overrun the sanatorium, the stranger's grandfather dying while hunting these creatures, and the stranger taking up the cause, killing the Makapichu that chased Hannah and Beth that fateful night, Hannah being forced to eat her dead sister to survive and turning into the Makapichu herself, as well as Josh's plans and blueprints for his vengeful night of terror. Or you can find none of that, and the characters will have no idea what's in the woods, no idea that Josh is behind it all until the big reveal, no idea who the stranger is, and you get unique dialogue. Of course, you can try to Scooby-Doo it yourself, you're only going to see It what sounds I like want Rami Malek's cadence. But I like that there's more story to be found. Also, I want to take a quick moment to highlight Jason Graves' soundtrack. I can't play it here without the video getting taken down, but I highly recommend giving it a listen on your own. It's eerie and almost fantastical in nature and suits the game really well. All this isn't to say that the game is perfect. It can be a real bummer if a character dies due to a botched QTE. And when characters die, or you do something very unexpected like avoid getting bitten as Emily, it can be obvious that people or dialogue are missing from some scenes. Take a look at this scene, for example, in which Sam and Mike react to a single dead body of someone that they already know is dead. Yeah. Bodies. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them. 
There are also some plot holes, like Chris being a victim of Josh's revenge plan, despite not being a part of the prank the year before. Additionally, the episode system doesn't save your choices, meaning that if you want to go back and try to make different decisions, you either need to wipe your save or play the game the whole way through in one sitting, from whichever episode you start at to the end. But at the end of the day, I still think these are minor complaints for an otherwise really solid game. And other people seem to think so too. The game reviewed well, with a 7.9 Metacritic score in 2023 and an 8.3 user score. The game also sold well at launch and generated a lot of buzz on social media at the time of the release. So where did Until Dawn go from there? Well, the team did maybe the best thing they could have done. Nothing. Okay, well, maybe not nothing. Given the multiple endings, there would have been no way to continue a story about this group of friends in any satisfactory way, so they didn't. The game only has two spin-offs, a 2016 non-canonical on-rail shooter called Until Dawn Rush of Blood, and a 2018 interactive horror prequel called The Inpatient set at Blackwood Sanatorium 63 years before the events of Until Dawn. Both are PlayStation VR exclusives that were met with mixed reviews, but that's it. These three games released over the course of less than three years comprise the entire series. Unlike the slasher movies that inspired it, which continue to pump out sequels to lower reviews and lower box office returns each time, Supermassive moved on. They still make horror games, including a spiritual successor called The Core in 2022, but Until Dawn as we know it, is done. Of course, that was true when I recorded this, but in the four months it's taken me to play the game twice to get all the footage I need, and then research the game and write the script, as well as edit the video uh, alongside working a full-time job, uh, they've announced not only a remaster of the game, but also a movie adaptation as well. Um, I'm not sure how badly the game needs a remaster, um, the game, the original game still looks and plays really well, at least it does on the PS5, which is where I played it, um, and the movie, I'm also a little unsure of, just because it is a movie adaptation of a choose-your-own-adventure game with multiple endings, uh, that's already based on movies, and I know that historically, uh, video game adaptations, uh, really kind of struggle. But it is being directed by David F. Sandberg, who is the director of one of, if not the best DCU EU movie um, in Shazam. And, and he also directed uh, Lights Out, which is, in my opinion, a, a, a very good, very good horror short. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm a little on the fence. I, I think if anyone can do it, he can. Um, but I guess time will tell. And by the way, if, if David F. Sandberg ends up seeing this, if Mr. Sandberg sees this, or any casting directors related to the movie, don't you think I bear more than a passing resemblance to, uh, Jessica? Anyway, I, uh, I streamed the game a few months ago on Twitch. You can find highlights, uh, on this channel here, uh, or, you know, you can, you can check out some of my other social media. Um, my TikTok is Eric with a K streams, uh, and you can check out highlights there, or you can check out live streams on my Twitch, twitch.tv slash with a K Eric. Uh, as I said, I work full time, so I, I can't stream too much anymore. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in and, and watching to the end of the video. Uh, I really appreciate it and I hope I'll see you around. Um, but if I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Deuces. Understand the palm of my hand, bitch.